Take those Bibles and turn them to Acts chapter 17, one of the locations that pastor's going to go see in Acts chapter 17 on his trip to the Mediterranean. Let me begin by saying I thank the Lord for my pastor. I count it a great honor and a great privilege to ever stand behind this desk and preach the Word of God. And I want to thank my pastor for that opportunity. If you are a guest here, make sure you make plans to come back and hear uh, our pastor, Pastor Chapel. We are very excited. You know, one of the things I love about pastor, he is, his vision and his passion has not diminished at all. I've only known him really for about six and a half years. But I will tell you, I think he is more passionate today than the first time I ever met him. He isn't going on the downward slope. He's going on the upward. And he is so excited about the Happiness Is series. So I hope we also will catch that vision as well. We come to Acts chapter 17, and there's a lot going on in the Apostle Paul's life. He's been traveling on this missionary trip. He was in Philippi, and a lot of things happened there. A church started there, and many trusted Christ, but there was opposition. He went to Thessalonica, and really right next door to the synagogue in the house of Jason, there was another church started. People were saved. However, there was opposition. And this opposition was even a threatening to his life, to Paul's life. So he moved on and he goes to Berea. Now in Berea, they really studied, received, and knew the scriptures. Boy, the Bereans are, are just an example to all of us, the way that we're supposed to welcome in the word of God, study the word of God, examine the word of God. But there was opposition there as well. So Paul leaves with a couple men that are gonna escort him about 200 miles south to the epic center of the cultural world. Rome would have been the world center for government, but Athens would become and is the world center for culture. Now, 500 years previous to this, Athens was really the epic center of the entire world and it was controlling the entire world. Those days are now gone, but the culture, the philosophy, and the melting pot of what Athens represents, to me, is an incredible parallel to the United States of America and the culture that we live in. There's several great and popular and well-known messages that are preached in the book of Acts. I think without any question, if any of you know it all, the book of Acts, you would probably say, that 50 days after the resurrection at the Feast of Pentecost, when Peter went up the steps of the temple and Peter preaches at Pentecost, where literally hundreds and even thousands of people trust Christ. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that day and under incredible spirit-filled power, Peter gives a historical record of the Torah of the Old Testament that's just unparalleled, leading all those events to Jesus Christ. So all the Jews that had gathered from all over the world to be there at Pentecost, obviously understood everything Peter was saying because Peter went into their scriptures, told their stories that they were born and raised on and made the connection to Jesus Christ. Acts 17 is not that setting. You are dealing with hundreds and thousands of people, think about this for a moment, that never even heard the name of Moses, let alone Jesus. You are dealing with a completely different culture in Acts 17 than you were in Acts 2 at the steps on the temple in front of all those Jews. Now that's an important point for all of us to understand. Because I stand today at 62 years of age in a country that I love, and I will tell you, I was born in 1957. We do not live in the Acts 2 culture of 1957. People knew the stories of the Bible. People knew the scriptures. People knew the Ten Commandments. 
I know it's a rough and a gruff word, but friend, we are in very much a pagan culture today. The things that you could use to say, I, I remember when we pastored up in Santa Maria, California, and we did this thing called a live nativity where literally hundreds and thousands of people drove through our property and in a 20 minute presentation, we gave the nativity story, the Bible story, and people with their windows down at the end, crying inside said, we've never heard this before. That's California. We do not live in Acts 2. We live in Acts 17. And what Paul does in Acts 17 is absolutely amazing. The presentation of the gospel of a risen Savior going in to this culture in Acts 2 is what he does is amazing. It all starts in verse number 16. And we look at this. I've entitled the message, Only One. For as I've studied this passage, there just seemed to keep only one this, only one that, only one this. So I kind of named it Only One. And uh, we start in Acts chapter 17. Would you look with me at verse number 16? Paul, or now while Paul waited for them at Athens. A couple things we need to say right there. Paul is all alone. The others went back to get Timothy and Silas to bring them back from Thessalonica. Paul is all alone in the city of Athens. Now I want to share a couple things with you. Number one, maybe at your workplace you feel like you are the only believer. You know, there's a lot of exciting things that happen with Paul in Athens. Don't ever think for a, for a moment, maybe you're the only believer on your neighborhood. Maybe you're the only believer in your family. Don't ever think for a moment that you can't have an impact. Paul is the only believer in the city of Athens. Think about that for just a moment. And yet, he did something. Now notice what happens. He's waiting for them to come. Now while Paul waited, what do you do while you're waiting for the coming of Christ? Are you saying it's defeated, there's no hope, America's gone, I'm just waiting to hear that trumpet blow and go to heaven? That's not what Paul does while he waits anywhere. Wherever Paul is waiting, he's thinking, he's stirred on how he's going to get the gospel out. By the way, that's the way we ought to live our lives. Whether we're in the doctor's office, whether we're in a line, think about while you're waiting somewhere this week, and chances are you will be, think about how to reach other people for Jesus Christ. Brother Scheller, the only waiting I'll be doing is on the 405, and there won't be anyone with me. Well, figure out, you know what, maybe put some cards up in your window or something or whatever. I don't. But while you're waiting, if nothing else, pray for those that are lost during that time. And by the way, and this is, I've done this a few times, not many. But sometimes when you're in that traffic jam on 405, just to begin to pray and see all those cars and to realize that they need Christ as their Savior. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens. Wow. Now, the Acropolis is there. Mars Hill is where Paul is going to preach. By the way, if you don't think the Christian life is exciting, think about Paul for a minute. When he came into Athens, I think the last thing he ever dreamed of is that he would be at the most prestigious spot in all of the Greek culture, standing on top of Mars Hill, declaring to them the true God. You know what? You never, you live for God. It is amazing where you will end up and where God will place you if you're on fire for the Lord and you have a passion for God and you live holy. It's amazing where God will place you and give you opportunities to do. I don't think Paul ever thought he'd be up in the Mars Hill. Well, so let me share this. So now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was, everyone together, what's the next word? Stir. Oh, that was terrible, everybody. His spirit was stirred. stirred. So my first point is, only one man was stirred. Now, this word is kind of interesting. 
I really absolutely love the word that we have in our King James Bible. Stirred, fired up, kindled. I mean, you take those embers, you blow on them, and it's burning. He's got a fire going on inside of him. The actual idea of the word is to provoke or contention. You know what it means? Paul was angry. There was an anger in Paul's spirit. Now, the way that that anger is going to come out is what we need to make sure that we get a hold of. I believe anger is the emotional energy of displeasure given to solve a problem. God gets us angry sometimes, and that anger is very energized to solve something. Now, some of you, and, and me as well, we've used our anger in the wrong way sometimes. But anger can be a good emotion that can be used. Here, Paul was stirred. And he was stirred at what he was seeing. Because look at this. Was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So here's this missionary that enters into the city. He's all by himself. And he's going around the Acropolis. He's going down to the marketplace, which was a huge center of all cultures from all over the world were coming. And he's hearing all these philosophies. He's seeing all of these things. And he's not enamored by it. He's enraged by it. Man, they got every altar to every god. The god, the, there's Socrates' little statue, and you got Plato, and you got the, he, all of the statues, and all of the graven images, and all of the idolatry, all of the paganism. They're all worshiping, but they're all worshiping the wrong god. And inside, Paul is stirred. There's an anger that begins to rise in his heart. Oh, God. They're worshiping everything but you. They're involved with every kind of sin. But God, they know not you. And he's walking around the city. He sees that and he's stirred. Look at verse 17. Now this is what Paul would always do. He would always go to the synagogue first, as he did in every one of these cities, so he does in uh, Athens. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. Now, the word disputed is not necessarily argued and debated. It really isn't. It is more dialogue discussed. Now, I can imagine they were high energy, and I can imagine uh, that there were a lot of people that disagreed with what he was saying. But he goes to the synagogue first, because the Bible says to the Jew first. So he goes into the synagogue and he begins to explain the faith in Christ and all of these things. He was able to give an answer for the hope that dwelleth in him. Now I want to tell you something. Some of you got all kinds of anger going on about your country. Some of you got all kinds of anger going on about the paganism you see in America. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you have an answer to go with your anger? Do you know how to respond to people? Oh, I'm so angry with these evolutionists. Well, let me ask you, do you know how to defend your faith? Oh, I'm so angry about what's happening here. Okay, super, that anger can actually be good. It stirred Paul. But do you have an answer that goes with your anger? And he did, for he disputed with them in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily. I mean, wherever Paul was going, man, he was talking about the Lord. He was giving answers for his hope, for what he believed with them that met with him. Okay, well, the word got out. This is a huge city, but the word got out about this guy named Paul. Then certain Philosophers, let me, let me, oh, I need to mention this. Three questions to be stirred. What do you do while you wait? We talked about that. What burdens and provokes, and what provokes you to anger? I think this is a righteous indignation. I think he is wholly upset about what he's seeing. And by the way, let me ask you, when was the last time you got angry at the sin you saw? Listen, I'm not talking about getting angry at people. I'm talking about getting angry at what's going on around you. And we have become so desensitized in what we're seeing. When, when, when I was a young man, uh, just like a young teenager, 
I remember one day I went out snowmobile ride and it had snowed the night before so snow had flocked all the trees there was a fresh two three four inches in northern Michigan on everything and it was just gorgeous so I went out there and went on snowmobile riding and I I had a snowmobile helmet but I didn't have any goggles on and I didn't have a, a, a mask so I didn't have like a tinted thing or anything like that so I was in this bright Sun for about two, three hours driving around my snowmobile. And I mean, it was bright. Every, the sun was reflecting off the snow. And I remember coming in. And when I walked in to take off my snowmobile suit, I walked in the house and I said, Mom, turn the lights on. And I remember my mom said, Jim, the lights are on. And I said, Mom, it's so dark in here. And I was like 13, 14 years old. I remember clearly as today, my mom saying, Jimmy, just stay by the door, take your snowmobile outfit off, and in a moment, you'll get used to the light. I said, okay, mom. So I stood there for a while, and it wasn't a couple minutes. I got used to the darkness around me. Let me tell you something. We have become so used to the darkness around us that the light doesn't shine bright in our heart because we're used to looking at darkness all the time. When Paul walked into that city, he was stirred with what he saw. Listen to these philosophies. Listen to what they're worship. Look at what they're worshiping. This is all idolatry. When was the last time you turned that TV off? When was the last time you stepped into a car? Hey, you're talking about my savior here. Hey, I, I just, with all, I, with all due respect to you, could you just stop talking about it like that? Could you stop saying that? Oh man, look at what, it, does anything anger you at all? Boy, Paul was stirred. He was stirred. Uh, then what burdens provokes you to anger? What will be your response to a world given to idolatry? Oh man, I got to tell you, brother, so you're preaching to the right guy today. I am so angry at what's going on in America. Okay, so this should be our response. Boldness. Oh, I'm ready, man. With love. Knowledge. With wisdom. Think about your answers. He's in the city of Athens a long time before he gets up to Mars Hill. He's putting together what, how he's going to respond. Truth with mercy and prayer with involvement. Wow. So if you're stirred in your heart about what's going on in our land, I would put these four couplets together in your life. Boldness with love, knowledge with wisdom, truth with mercy, and prayer with involvement. Number two, there's only one worldview that is right. Only one worldview is right. Now what happens is, everyone's starting to hear about this, Paul. So look at what they do. Verse 18, then certain philosophers that heard this Paul going around doing all this stuff, of the Epicureans, we'll talk about them in a minute, and of the Stoics, encountered him. Oh, what an encounter that had to be. We got the Epicureans. Now the Epicureans and the Stoics are as diametrically opposed to each other as any two philosophies as you could get. The Epicureans are all about one word, pleasure. I mean, to them, it's eat, drink, and be merry. Man, we only live once. Do whatever you desire to do. There's no restraints on it at all. The Stoics are the complete opposite. The Stoics are all about discipline, restraining yourself, and they're all about building yourself up. If you can conceive it, you can achieve it. And the Stoics are all about the logic of things and the, and the discipline of things and the restrictions of things, and the Epicureans are all about the pleasures. Now, it's interesting that both of these groups can get together when they come against Christ, when they come against Paul. Because it's amazing how enemies can take unity when, they're, when the object of what they're attacking is Christianity and truth, if you please. So we have these two. And the Epicureans was all about pleasure. The Stoics were all about pride. But Christianity and what Paul brought was all about peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Now, I want to share this with you. Now, before everyone you know, gives a few amens or whatever like this, stop for just a moment. Do you honestly believe that your message transcends, is superior, 
and is the only answer there is for people's lives. Now, hold on. Do you really believe that your message is greater and is for every human being in the United States and in this world? Do you honestly believe that the gospel that you say you have is actually the answer? See, Paul did. Paul believed that I've got the answer for you Epicureans. You're never going to find pleasure. You're going to try this. You're going to try this. You're going to try this. Hey, we got a guy that was one of us Jews. His name was Solomon. He tried it all. It's not going to work. Hey, you Stoics, you're going to lead yourself to suicide, which the, great, the largest group of suicide was found with the Stoics because they were so self-righteous, so full of pride, so think that they knew so much that finally they saw the emptiness of their logic, that it was no good as well. And the Stoics committed suicide more than any other group of people back then. And he's going, I got the answer to this. So we come to verse 18, and he said, so he encounters them both. Some said, oh, what will this babbler say? And you know what? That's going to happen. People are going to say things about you. Matter of fact, if babblers as bad as it gets, you're doing all right. Others, some, he seemeth to be a great setter forth of strange. Now, the next word is interesting. Notice what form it's in. Strange what? Everyone together. Gods. It's in plural. Gods. Now, I believe that they looked at these two things as two separate gods. They were so pantheistic. They were so multi-God. Look at this. Because he preached unto them Jesus, that's one of this guy's gods, and the resurrection. There's another one of his gods. You say, Brother Shetler, how's the resurrection uh, a god? It's a philosophy. And they, can, they looked at philosophies can be gods. They worship different philosophies. I think that they actually looked at, okay, so we got to find out about these, this guy's two gods. He's got this one God named Jesus, and then he's got this one God, this philosophy, this resurrection that there's life after death. That's kind of interesting to us because we don't look at death that way, and we're consumed with it. By the way, the Greek word, they were consumed with mythology and all about death and all this corruption as well. So we got someone that's going to rise from the dead. I want to know about this philosophy, this God, and I want to know about this God guy that he keeps talking about, Jesus. So we look at verse number 19. And they took him and brought him to Arapagas, saying, may we know what is new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Now this is important to understand. To them, this is a new doctrine. We would say, hey man, this goes all the way back to Korea. I understand that, you understand that, but that's not the culture we live in. Do you know when you talk about Jesus to people today, especially in California, especially in the area that we live in? You know, I've never heard this before. When I, uh, uh, of course, I lived in the South for 31 years. Now, I don't think the people of the South on the whole are any more saved, and there's more of them than even out here in California, just to be honest. But I'll tell you what, they sure know the, the religious lingo. I can remember going to the first door in Santa Maria when I went out door to door, knocking on the door and talk to someone about Jesus. I said, I said, would you ever like to receive Christ? Would you like to receive Christ as your savior? And the guy looked at me and I mean, the first time I ever went out door to door in Santa Maria, California, he looked at me and he says, I have no idea who Jesus is. Well, that was never a response in Pensacola, Florida. Let me just tell you. Everybody knew Jesus. Everybody knew Jesus. Oh, Jesus is my buddy. Jesus is Jesus that. And I went like, whoa, well, let me tell you something. We don't live in Acts 2. We live in Acts 17. And my friend, I'm going to tell you something. There are people that have no clue who Jesus Christ is. They, have, they, might, and they only know him as a swear word. And they have no clue who he is. So, they, so they're going to, um, so we see we've got one worldview. And, and I want you to see verse, uh, verse 21. For all the, uh, or verse, uh, verse 20, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. Well, we've never heard anything like this. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. We want to find out more about this. For all the Athenians and the strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. 
Their whole time was spent on just talking about philosophies. They just, hey, what is your point of view? What is your point of view? Can I tell you, there's a verse in the Bible that explains that perfectly, Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. They all had their own little philosophy. They all had their own little idea on life. So this is my little philosophy about life. And this is my, hey, we gotta, have you heard about this guy named Paul? He's, you gotta hear his thing, man. He's got this, this, this God, this Jesus God, and then he's got this thing that's resurrection God. And this resurrection God, I wanna know more about this thing. And all they looked at this was a new thing. Oh. To put your life into this? To actually really believe this? Oh, no, no, no. We're just, we want to talk about this. We want to learn more about this as well. And this is the kind of things that stirred Paul. So only one worldview is right. And let me tell you what it is. It's got to be a biblical worldview. It's the only one that will bring peace. The only one that will bring purpose. The only one that will bring perspective. The only one that will bring protection. And the only one that will bring power. Now, I want to tell you. Every person came into this auditorium today with a worldview. There is a way that you look at the world. There is a way that you look at politics. There is a way that you look at your health. There is a way that you look at finances. Every one of us came in here with a worldview. And every one of us is going to leave with a worldview. There's only one worldview that will change lives, and there's only one worldview that will get you the right destination. And that's a biblical worldview. What you have to do is you have to see the Bible, you have to see the world with Bible glasses on. And that's what Paul brings in. He brings in a philosophy that is absolute truth. That is unheard of for these philosophers. He brings in something into the world that I guarantee you they have never experienced before. He is going to tell them what is right and what is wrong. He's going to tell them that they are living in idolatry. He is going to tell them they're a bunch of pagans. And he's going to tell them that God created them, that God loves them. God's got a plan for them and you can live eternally with him. And that is totally foreign to anything that they have ever heard before. Only one worldview. But then, this is to me the climax of this whole passage. Look at verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. This would be like the Supreme Court. Now, Rome is now the governing power authority. So Mars Hill has definitely lost its authority, but it has not lost its appeal. People would come to Mars Hill to discuss, to debate over different philosophies of worldview, of what you think and what you think. It was a huge place, a prominent place, and for you to be able to give arguments at Mars Hill was like going to the Supreme Court. It had no weight to it and no authority to it, but wow, did it have popularity and did it ever have acceptance. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. You know he prayed. You know he asked God, Lord, how do I present the truth? This culture is so different than the Jewish culture. What is there? And one day when he was in the Acropolis, in the marketplace, going from one idol, uh, idol god to another, and he was walking by, he stops. And there is an altar. But there's nothing on the altar. And the altar is inscribed, and it says, this altar is to the unknown God. In other words, they were saying, you know what, we've got thousands. Matter of fact, one historian wrote this. It was easier to find a God in Athens than to find a man in Athens. That's how many gods there were. And it says here in, in, in our scriptures, they were wholly, fully given over to idolatry. They were everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And he comes to this one. And basically, the Athenians were just kind of covering themselves. Okay, if we missed a god, this is the one then. This will be the one to the, god, to the unknown god. And Paul stood there and went, that'll preach. That'll preach. So he goes up to Mars Hill. 
The Epicureans are ready with their arguments. Man, live life and enjoy it. Pleasure, eat, drink, and be merry. The Stoics are ready with their disciplined, logical arguments, and everyone's around. And Paul says, I declare unto you today, I saw an inscription in an altar to the unknown God. I would like to tell you who your unknown God is. Now, this is marvelous for so many reasons. He enters in to the culture, not to become the culture, but to change the culture. He enters into the culture. He has enough, by the way, he knows the Greek poets. He's going to quote one of the Greek poets here in just a moment. He knows where he lives. He knows who he's dealing with. And he enters in with boldness with probably the greatest object lesson you will ever find in a message to an Acts 17 crowd. He says, I would like to declare unto you this God who you say you do not know, for that is why I'm here. And that's my next point. Only one God is God. Only one God is God. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. I love the word superstitious. It does have the idea of you're so religious. You guys worship everything. And by the way, before you don't think you can connect to this, I know a lot of people that worship athletics. I know a lot of people that worship Hollywood. I know a lot of people that worship their money. I know a lot of people that worship a lot of things. And I just want to tell you this right now. If you don't think that America is full of idolatry, there's a lot of things between Americans and God and what they consider important and what they consider their God to be. You may look at this and go like, well, I'm glad we're not that barbaric of a culture like the Athenians. Let me tell you something. They were probably a lot smarter than we were. They were probably a lot more intelligent than we were. And don't look at them and go like they bow down to these little idols. My friend, we bow down to it all the time. We'll watch a television program instead of doing something else. We'll, we'll spend time or money on this or that or whatever it is. Our little hobbies really are nothing else than little idols in many places. And our culture is permeated with these idols. That would have been a good time for an amen, but I don't mind. Okay. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. What's about to happen is the greatest, personal opinion, the greatest definition of God in the entire Bible. And even if you disagree with that on that, I don't, you, I'd love for you to show me another passage of Scripture that will define our God better than what we're about to read. But even if you disagree with that, let me tell you this. What he does next is what we need so badly in our culture. We are using the word God, and I am telling you, the people you work with, the people down your street, and your family members have no idea who God is. we got to start with a definition of who God is. And Paul knows that until they understand who this God is, it doesn't matter what I say about him. Lancaster Baptist Church, get a definition of God and begin to use it because our culture knows not. When someone says, well, you know, God, stop. So who is God? What is God? I believe this is the greatest definition in the Bible. Look at verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein. Okay, so we're going to start off defining God by God being the creator of all the world. And I believe that is a great place to start in a pagan society, that our God is is God because he is the creator of all the world. If there is anything 
that has driven America into a pagan society more than this. I don't know what it is, and that's evolution. We start with the belief that God created us and that God created the entire world because that gives us purpose. That gives us a plan that shows his power. We need to hear more about the creator God. Grandparents, if you got little grandkids, talk to them about the creator God. If you teach anywhere, give credit to the creator God. Wherever you are, when you stop and pray in your restaurant over the food, you are thanking God for the food that he created. Everywhere we go, we should be ambassadors for the creator who created our world. I love how he starts this. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven. Oh, by the way, Epicureans and earth. He is sovereign. He has revealed himself. He is the creator. He is sovereign. Look at his power dwelleth not in temples made with hands. No, no, no. Do not make, man can make this God. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. This God is completely sufficient. He needs nothing or no one. He is God. Anything seen, he giveth to all life. He is the life-giving God and breath and all things. He is the one who put it all together. Can you imagine this scene for a moment? Can you imagine those Stoics? who they've considered and built their whole world around themselves as their own God, all of a sudden saying, there is a creator God. You are responsible to him. He's got the power. He is sovereign. Look at the next verse. And hath made of one blood all nations. We see only one man was stirred. We see only one worldview is right. We see only one God is God. Number four, I don't want to spend a long time on it, but Paul preached it. I think it's really well for us to look at this for a moment. And hath made of one blood all nations. Number four, there is only one race that exists. There is only one race of people that exists. In the next weeks and months ahead, the word racism and racist will probably be one of the most prevalent words in our English language that will be used in the months ahead. I want to stand and tell you this. God is the creator of all mankind. And when God created all mankind, he created them one blood. The idea behind that word in the Greek is blood relationship, gang, kin. We have all been created the human race. And there's only one race of people. There's not this race. There's different nationalities. Oh, 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 yeah, absolutely. There's different languages. There's different customs. There's different cultures. But there is only one race of people on planet earth. Jesus Christ died for all of mankind. And I believe that Christianity has a truth that the world needs to hear. There is so much tension. There is so much hatred. And racism and races produces divisiveness. We are one blood, folks. We are one kin. God created all of us and we all came from Adam and Eve and then we all came from Noah and his sons. And my friend, I just want you to know, it is imperative what he says here because the Greeks thought they were superior to all other, they would have said races. And Paul stands at Mars Hill and gives a philosophy that is so needed today in 2019 in America. And Paul stands and says, hey guys, I just want you to know, we're all one people. And I'm gonna tell you about this God, this one God for all of people. What a statement. 
and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. Okay, so in other words, he is sovereign. He's risen up nations, he's brought nations down. He's risen up kings, he's brought kings down. Hey, you're Plato guy, you're Socrates guy, only God has allowed that in his perimeters and his boundary. But look at the next verse. That they should seek the Lord. Oh, what a message. In the middle of this incredible sovereignty of God passage, he slips in the free will of man. He puts in, God is sovereign. This Lord who you know not, he is Lord. He is the king. He's over everything. He rises up nations and brings down nations. However, he allows man to have a free will that they should seek the Lord. Aren't you glad for a whosoever will gospel? Everyone can come to know Christ and everyone has the will and ability to choose as well. Boy, what a, oh, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might, now this one sounds kind of weird, but I really like this. They might feel after him. Oh, so brother, this is kind of an emotional thing. No. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been in a completely dark room trying to feel for the light switch? I know it's somewhere. I know it's somewhere. I can't, I, I can't, I know. Oh, I got it. That's what it meant. You guys are blind. but feel for him, seek him. And look at this, look at this. Because he's going, oh yeah, he's playing games with me. The light switch is on the other wall. No, it's not, look what it says. They, they shall seek the Lord, if happily they may feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The light switch is right there. Epicureans, look at me. Stoics, look at me. You're searching, aren't you? I'm going to tell you about the God who's right there. And when you reach out to him in faith, he turns the light on and you can see. My friend, you might have came in here tonight spiritually this morning blind. Man, I got I to gotta find something here, man. I, this is like my last resort. I'm going to this church. I got to find something. The switch is right there, guys. The switch is right there. You want to see? By faith, ask Christ to be your Savior, and the light turns on. It's right there. They feel for him, like a blind man is trying to find something, and it's right by you. Look at verse 28. For in him, now this is so interesting. This is a quote from Greek poets. For in him, we live and move and have our being, as certain also of you, own poets, have said, for we are also his offspring. Look at verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God. Oh, Brother Shetler, I always thought this. So God is everybody's father, and we're all children of... No, that's not what this refers to. What this refers to is our creation. And when God created us, the raccoons are not the offspring of God. Your, your puppy dog back home is not the offspring of God. No bird that you'll see flying today is the offspring of God. We are the offspring of God because we were created in the image of God. Amen. We were given a free choice. We don't go by instinct. We go by our will. We were given a God consciousness. And when we were given a God consciousness, we were created like God in that. We are the offspring of God. But let me tell you this. You are not the child of God until you receive his son, Jesus Christ. And by receiving the son of God, you get into the family of God. So we are the offspring of God in the sense that we were created in his image. But we 
are not the offspring of God as children of God until we get into his family. But as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You might have came into here today and thinking, oh, God is my father, and I just, you know, I'm one of his children. You're not if you haven't trusted Christ. The only way to get in the family is through him. But you were created in the image of God, and in that sense, you are his offspring. I am telling you, this is one of the most powerful messages on who God is anywhere in the Bible, and it is what we need to propagate. Look at verse number 30. For as much then, or verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver. Come on, you weren't created like gold and silver. So why would you think your God is like that? Verse 30, and the times of this ignorance, God winked at. Now I want you to see the past, present, and future in like two sentences. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now, Commandeth, commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in that which he will judge the world. Wow, it's taken me like 40 minutes. He said it like in two sentences. He said the past, the present, and the future. Here's what he said. You know what? In the past, because of your ignorance, God tolerated it, but he ain't tolerating it no more. You got to repent and you got to change your mind, buddy. You got to make a decision. And I'll tell you why, because there's a judgment that's coming. Paul did not hold back anything. And I want everyone to hear this. Paul went into that Athenian culture, but he didn't become that Athenian culture. He used that culture to be able to give the gospel. And this is extremely important. He lets them have it. Well, Brother Scheller, in this culture, you shouldn't mention judgment. Yeah, we should mention judgment because the Bible mentions judgment. Brother Shetler, you shouldn't use that R word, that repent word. That doesn't go good in this culture. Paul says, you got to change your mind. You got to repent. You got to repent. And he said, you know what? You were ignorant and God allowed that, but no more. It is now time for you to make a decision. Can you imagine how quiet it got at Mars Hill at that moment? And then he brings in Jesus because here it is. So he says, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, Jesus, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him, Jesus, from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, by the way, I think this is interesting. They're, see, they're still all on their philosophy stuff. They're, they miss Jesus, and they're going to this other God, this resurrection. But you don't have the resurrection without Jesus, let me tell you. Some mocked, and others said, we will hear this again of this matter. Now, I think this is is going to be interesting, and I close with this. You got three groups of people there on Mars Hill. You got some that after he got done talking, they started giggling. They go, Oh man, oh, oh, this guy is good, man. Oh, that is like the funniest stuff I've ever heard. You have some that were like, Man, that is interesting. We well, got some more questions to ask him. I'm interested in this. And then you have a few that clave. You had a few that believed. When you go into the community and you talk to them about happiness is and you leave the door, I'm sure sometimes they go, <laughs> those people at that church, man, they're here all the time. They're just, they're just a funny group. I'm sure there's some going, you know, what is happiness? Maybe I'll try to find out. And then there's another group. I want that happiness in Jesus Christ, and I want to receive them. There may be someone in that group here today. Maybe some of you will leave here with a little bit of laughter, like, man, that guy was a joke. Maybe some of you, man, that, that's really interesting. I, he got my interest up. But I pray that there's a Damaris in here, a Dionysus, that would say, you know what? I want that relationship. Folks, do you realize what this whole campaign is? This whole campaign is using an unknown God, because our, our community is searching for happiness. So on October 6th, we're going to give them happiness. We're going to give them Jesus. That's why it's important for you to start working on this. But I want to tell you, you also, 
have not been the salt and light that you should be because there's so many idols in your life. You haven't been stirred. When was the last time you got angry at something Hollywood produced? Something that you saw, something, that's it, man. No, I'm not watching it. Turn that thing off. Is there any kind of stirring in your heart? What's going on with your neighbors, your relatives, the people you work with? Is there a God? How do I reach them? I think God will show you. God will give you a, an altar to the unknown God object lesson. God will let you do that, but you gotta get stirred. And if you're here today, and by God's mercy, he allowed you to be in this church service today, and by God's sovereignty, he brought you here this morning, let me encourage you, by your free will, would you be willing to accept this Jesus? Isn't this the coolest thing? Paul preached this almost 2,000 years ago and it's still being preached today in California. God, this is it. Do you believe it?